So in general, types make things faster. So the more exact your types are, the more specialized the code can be. Usually this matters inside loops. For example, I have x, my x is an int for, so if I do like while x is greater than zero, x divided by two, and then, you know, something important. So now the type of x has changed. So now it's a float 64. That means that my, so my x, when x is eight at the top, it's an int. We go through this loop, and then at the bottom, x is a float. This is a problem if your loop is important, like for performance, like if you have a big loop, because that means that all of the code inside the loop will go, well, I don't know whether x is gonna be an int or a float on this iteration. It could be either one. So I'm going to, so Julia will, will output its code. You should also always use functions if you're, um, if you're for performance reasons, because the uh, currently, code inside generic functions, inside any kind of function is more, inside generic functions is more optimized than stuff you type into the REPL. Um, so in this case, I want to put my for loop inside a loop, but more importantly, I'm, my ty the type of X is wobbling, so it's going, so it's outputting slower code than if you started out with like X equals 8.0. So if X is a float to begin with and a float at the end, we can write, out, we can output a code that's as fast as compiled code, because it goes, oh, well I know the type of X is going to be a float. And I know that inside all of my loop iterations is gonna be a float so I can write out code that just only knows how to deal with floats because that's all I'm going to have. Um, so in some cases, types are important. I'm not sure whether the types of dictionaries are important. I've never, I haven't seen a discussion of dictionaries in performance, and especially performant code. There are um, profiling stuff for Julia so you could check it out if you wanted to. Um, in general, for faster code, you should use types. So, okay, so we talked about arrays and dictionaries. Does anybody have any questions on the stuff I've covered so far? Cool, so we're gonna go on to macros. Julia has Lisp style macros, which means that they work on the AST as opposed to C style macros. So C has its like defined statements that are string based, where you're just, you know, taking in a string and then like outputting something over that string, but like it, it just treats code as strings. This is not a good representation of code. So in Lisp style macros, you get to touch the AST. And that's, the AST is the abstract syntax tree. That means it's a representation in the programming language of the structure of the programming language. Um, so one quick, well, we'll set some expressions first. So you can use the colon operator to um, quote an expression. So like if I quote two, I'm just gonna get two because that's all it is. But two plus two when quoted becomes this quoted plus two two. Um, so as that, the way that printed out implied, I can type in plus two two and I'll get back four. So like plus works either prefix or infix, so it works as both a function name and an operator. But more importantly, so if we get back to here, so if I say like e equal to that, so the type of e is expert, and name, so type, pro I should probably cover types before I go into macros. But in any case, e has these properties, head, args, and type, without an e because that would collide with the keyword type. I'm gonna cover types now, I should have written that, I should have done that before. So we have two kinds of types in Julia. We have abstract types and um, concrete types. Abstract types can have subtypes, concrete types can be instantiated. All of the types we've used so far are concrete types because we were making values of that type. Um, so if you wanna, so an abstract type is just a name. So if I say abstract cat, now I have the type cat, type of cat is data type, the type that represents types. The type of data type is data type. Obviously the type of, that represents types is also represented as a type. Um, so, okay, so we have abstract cat, so now cat is this point in our type hierarchy. So Julia's type hierarchy, you have all of the leaves at the bottom, the ones that have no children are concrete types, and then each type has one parent. So each, each type, leaf type has a parent, and then each of those types will each have one parent all the way until you get up to the type of the top of the hierarchy. So we can take, 
we, and we have functions where we can explore the type hierarchy. So let's start with the type of two in 64. So the super of the super type of that of in 64 is signed, and the super type of that is integer, real, number, any. The super type of any is any. So any is at the top of our type hierarchy. All types descend from any. Um, so if we go back to say like integer. So integer is a type. I can take the subtypes. If I could type sub. So if we ask for the subtype of integer, subtypes of integer, we'll get all of these. If we take the sub subtypes of say uh, signed, we'll get all of those different kinds of in all those different sizes of signed integers. Um, so this is like just demonstrating some functions that we have for manipulating the type hierarchy and wandering around it. This means that some people have like made maps of the type hierarchy because if you start from any and take your subtypes all the way down, you'll be able to find all of the types. And you'll be able to do, you, and because this is just data, you can use perfectly normal Julia code to programmatically, manip, like, to programmatically explore the type hierarchy and then graph things in the same way you would any other kind of data. So you don't use any different tools for working with types. They're just first class types. They're, you can talk about them using all of the same normal expressions you use for any other Julia code. Um, so now that we have, now that we've talked a little bit about the structure of like the type hierarchy, we can define a type. So you'd use the keyword type. Um, you'd name your type. So I'm going to call this one, uh, I don't know. So I'm going to have a type kangaroo. Um, and then I can give it properties. So I can give it a color. So maybe my kangaroo is green or something. And I didn't put a type on that one, but so maybe I'll have like height, and that's all I'm going to make all of those float 64s. So now writing no type on color is equivalent to doing colon colon any. Like they're exactly equivalent. So you can just leave that off and it will be of type any. Um, so height is float 64. I use the same colon colon that I used in that argument list, and it means about the same thing. So no, the only values of height, height, values of height will always be float 64. It's good to put types on this because it helps the type inference. If you're getting, if any function that uses a kangaroo will now know height is gonna be a float 64 and can optimize accordingly. Uh, and then we use end blocks because all of our things end with end. Um, so, okay, so I have a kangaroo. So let's see what it says about our kangaroo. And look, we already have a constructor. I didn't have to do anything and I got a constructor. So let's look at the methods of kangaroo to see the constructors. If you take the methods of a type, you'll get, the, you'll get all of the constructors. Um, so my kangaroo just takes the properties that I defined, so it's the same order top to bottom is left to right for my constructor list. This is the default constructor. Anytime you create a type, it will be created. Um, if you don't want anyone to have access to that constructor for some reason, you can define your type a little bit differently. So let's see, so if we want have um, lions and they have, I don't know, a color, and a roar, and their roars are all strings. Then we can define lion. So I'm only going to let you set the color of your lion. So lion of color equals new. So this is a special keyword inside of types. And then all, my lion is gonna be whatever color you set, and all of them are going to say rar. And so now, if I look at methods of lion, my only constructor is color. This doesn't like completely fix things for you, like because you can always, so if L equals a lion and it's going to be a yellow lion, my yellow lion says rar names of L. It's the same thing as like names of lion, they'll both show you the same properties. 
l dot ror is rar. Use that notation to access properties. l dot ror equals ror. Now I've changed the property. Like I couldn't construct one, so you didn't make it easy for me. But I can still, if it's my data, I can still mess with it. Um, however, I won't be able to set ror to say five because that's not a string. And I said that lines, roars are always strings. All right, so those, you can also have um, an immutable type. So immutable, so all of our types so far, we could change. Immutable types, um, you cannot change the values inside them. That, mean, that has like impacts for uh, performance optimizations. So Julia understands what immutable means and it can optimize the code differently if it knows that it won't be changed. So it can like inline things and pass things around differently because you know that the, you don't have to like always be looking at the same copy of the data because it can't change. So my immutable starfish um, has some number of legs and that's gonna be an int 64. You can also just write that as int. Int is just an alias for int64. All right, so I have an immutable starfish. S equals starfish of six. So now names of S, S dot num, S dot legs. Oops. Okay, so S has a number of legs, which is six. I think it should have seven. But I can't do that because starfish is immutable. Um, so I could create something else that would create a new starfish with a different number of legs, which in this case is just the constructor. But you can, so you can't edit the properties of an immutable type in some cases, you might want to have immutable types of that if you can, because it make your code, might make your code faster. Um, so, okay, so we talked about, so this is also a good point to talk more about multiple dispatch. Um, so I'm going to exit out of my interpreter really quick so I can do my normal multiple dispatch example without messing up the types that I've defined so far. So you'll note that control C doesn't get you out of the REPL. You need to use control D. and control L will let you clear the REPL so that you get back to the top of the screen. All right, so if I have a type, all right, so I can make a type uh, koala, um, and its sound is a string, and I make an abstract cat, and then I'm gonna show you how to subtype, which I haven't so far. And this uh, left arrow colon is the subtype operator. So then I just put cat over here. And that operator is still just a function. Like that's still a normal function. It's just special. Like, this, is a fun this is an operator that's defined for types. And then so I'm still going to have my lion have a roar and a color. I wish I could spell today. Okay, so then I'm going to have another type, um, tiger, which is also a kind of cat. And it has, so has stripes, is a bull. Um, roar is a string. Uh, okay, so now we have enough types that I can give you a sort of example. So first let's like look at our subtype hierarchy real quick, now, since this is one that we know from the beginning. So subtypes of cat are lion and tiger. Note that, that there was like a distinct pause before it did that, but the second time I run it, it's very fast. That's the JIT compiler at work. The first time you run a function will be longer than the other times. This has implications for benchmarking. So if you're benchmarking an operation, you should run the function first like, so you run it once to let it compile, and then you should do your benchmarking. 
Otherwise, you're going to get weird numbers because they look much slower than it is because the first time is n slower than the rest of the times. All right, so we have lions and tigers, and I think it was koala. Yeah, so, all right, so I'm going to define a function. Let's see. So function make noise, and that will take a something. So this will just take anything. Um, and so, wait, this is, sorry. So I, this, should, this is the one that needs to be specific. So I can take a koala and return k dot, it has a sound, I believe. Let me just double check that names of koala, yeah. So this will return k dot sound, which will be a string um, function make noise of L, where L is a lion, will return L.roar, function make noise on tigers, will return T.roar. Ah. Okay. So now, if I make some, I'm just going to show you that this works. So. L equals lion. Um, if you tab complete here, you get the uh, method, the signature you want, which is handy. Okay, so rar, and I'm going to have a green lion today. And then T equals tiger, and it will have, so my tiger is going to have stripes are um, true and false are lowercase in written lowercase in Julia. And then it will have and then K is a koala and it will just have its sound. Okay, so make noise will work on all of these because each of them has their own method, right? As expected. Okay, so now um, one other thing I could do would be to do make noise of C colon colon cat. Ah, it would help if I typed colons. Ah, and the function keyword. Okay, so function make noise of cat. So this is going to return C dot roar. So I'm going to make, so obviously I already have functions for lion and tiger. So I'm going to make a new type, house cat, subtype of cat. House cat will also have a roar. So h equals house cat, and it will have, and it will meow for its roar. And so now we know that make noise has specific functions for koala, lion, and tiger, but nothing for house cat. So H is my house cat. So if I call make noise of H, it works because I have a method for cat. I can also update these functions. So like for So I make the make noise of Carger become like the tiger says roar. So now if I call make noise of T, um, notice that I used notice that I used the uh, times operator instead of plus for because Julia is written by mathematicians, they decided that times was a more appropriate way to append strings. I don't have an opinion on it, but it's important to uh, notice that. Okay, so now I'm going to make another function just for cats called meow. Meow will take any cat and call Okay, so, oh wait, sorry, that's not a good example. That's what I was just going to call the other one. So, 
let's, let's have the uh, animals fight. That's more exciting. Um, and also, the, for so far, we've only been, like, it doesn't matter that we have multiple versus single dispatch so far, because I've only been using one, one, one argument functions. But now I'm going to show you a two argument function so that we can look at how multiple dispatch works. To, talk, to think about like which method is likely to get is going to be called by the compiler. Okay, so if a koala fights a cat, so who should win? Who should win? Koala. Okay, so koalas are winning. Okay, the koala defeated the cat. Okay. So now we'll have a function for, let's say, so if we have a lion and a tiger, who should win? Uh, you in the front in orange. Who wins in that fight, lions or tigers? Okay. All right, so. The tiger defeated the lion. All right, so let's see what, what we have so far. So if I have my koala fight the lion, the koala defeated it, again with the tiger. If I have the tiger fight the lion, we, aren't, we don't have one for that yet. And if I have the lion fight the tiger, then the tiger wins. Okay, so... If we have the, let's see, so function fight. And so now if we have the koala fight a lion. So I'm going to show you a new, uh, another, so another syntax for defining functions. Um, so I can just do function name, arguments, and then as long as my function body is only one line, this works. So the function keyword like begins a block that you have to end with n. If I don't use the function keyword, then I don't get a block so I can just do one statement. This is really nice sometimes when you want to like make your code, like if you have, if you have like functions that are just calling other functions, especially like with constructors where you're just like filling in default arguments, then you don't really need like a whole body, it's only one line anyway, so you can write them this way. All right, so if the koala is fighting a lion, not just any cat, but specifically a lion, who wins? You in the front in green. Okay, so the lion defeated the koala. Okay, so now we have, so now for, we have multiple methods of fight, right? And so, here we have two methods that both start with koala. And so like in most object-oriented languages, we would only care about koala and then dispatch based on the rest of the arguments, which like looks about the same as what we're doing here, right? We have two implementations. So if a lion fights, a koala fights a lion, and specifically we have a special implementation. So if k and l fight, we get a new result instead of, as opposed to k and t. This also works the same way if I switch the arguments. So for example, if I have, so a fight of um, C colon colon cat and K is a koala, then let's say the koala still wins so that it works either way. The koala still defeats the cat. So now we can call fight of, say, a lion and a koala. So, but if I call it with, so now if I make another one for lion, and k is a koala, Now that changes. It picks the most specific one that it has. Um, so there's one other thing that I think is important to show you, um, and that is what can we do to make this not work? So like, what can we do to confuse the dispatch system? 
So it's dispatching based on the closest type it can get. So what if we had one where we have a lion and a cat, and then we have another one where we have a cat and a lion? Because each of those, one of them matches perfectly, lion, we call it, we call it with two lions, and the other one matches, you know, not so good because, like, okay, but not perfect. So it's like one step up to cat. But they're each like one off. What do you think the compiler would do in that case? Like, if you were a dispatch system, like, what are you going to do? And then we have the cat fighting a lion. So now I'm about to do something that is probably going to be a bit confusing, right? We're not sure what's going to happen now. And, nice enough, we get an error message telling us that the compiler also does not know what's going to happen next. So it's warning us that we should really define something specific for two lines because we've created an ambiguity. So if I have the lion fight the lion, we do get an answer. So like our code still works, it just picked one. So in this case, the lion goes first version. But I can't promise that like in your, like in your version, or it's not gonna depend on some random thing, like this might change. Like this is just some sort of like, it picked one so that your code works, but it warns you first to tell you that this is going to be a problem, like if you care about which method you're calling here. So we can define L1 colon colon lion and L2 colon colon lion. So like nothing is broken here like permanently, now we can just call So now I've defined a new function. Nothing has gone like wrong with my system. There's no really big problem. Now I, call my, I define a lion lion thing and it works. It's just a momentary, when you don't have something defined, it's going to just pick one. And when you create that problem is when it tells you that there is there could be a problem. There is like an ambiguity here. All right, does anybody have any questions about multiple dispatch functions, anything we've covered so far? Yes. So the question is whether it would tell me when I called message of fight that there's an ambiguity, and that's no. The error only shows up right when you define that function. It doesn't keep yelling at you about it over and over. A lot of errors in Julia only show up once, so like when things are deprecated, you'll get a deprecated warning the first time you call the function, and then it won't bother you anymore. That avoids things like if you use a function a bunch in your code, and you, like, you're calling it in a loop or something, you don't get like millions of lines of output or something, you just get it once. All right, so I'm going to move on to macros now. Macros are very exciting. So, for, so macros let you, um, so the power of macros is that you get your arguments unevaluated, which means that you can change them. So for example, you can do stuff with functions without actually calling them. So like at which for two plus two. At which is a macro that tells you which, which exactly which method you're going to call and where it's defined without calling the function. So for example, I could call fight of L, L, and which will tell me, so it doesn't do lines numbers so well in the REPL, that's like, there's no real line numbers in the REPL, so it doesn't work as well. Um, but it does tell me which method I would call. So in this case, um, it's not as useful. It's very useful when you want to look up where a function in base is. So, if, so like for example, if we look at the plus one, it tells me which file and which line number. So if you go into your Julia folder, if you've gotten the source distribution from GitHub, and you go into your source directory, or base directory, sorry, the base folder will have all of these files in it, and so you can just look for int.jl. In fact, we can go do that on GitHub. Um, I wish I could read those words. Is this base? Oh. Oops. So if I go into base. And then I pick int.jl, we'll be able to look at where plus is, the way plus is defined. 
So I need to move this to where I can see it. Uh, okay, so there is int.jl. And let's see, we were looking for line 41. And there we have it. There's exactly where, like you can see, it's just defined just like a normal function. A little bit of like extra unboxing magic to make it faster, or to, like to do, isn't this low level, you have to think about more stuff, but it's defined just like, so you use the same syntax. Most of, basically all of Julia is written in Julia. There's like some C in there and like some scheme for the parser, but the majority of like the base libraries are all written in Julia, which means that if you have a problem, you can go, I think the base library is at fault. You can go read the code and see what it does and see if it doesn't make sense for, your, for what you think it should do. And you can change it and give us a pull request. So you, like, once you know Julia, you can work on Julia itself and there's not really anything more you have to learn because it's all just one language. Um, so like, there's a very small hop up. When you find a bug, you can go fix it because you know the, all of the like, languages involved. Um, so at which is a, is a very useful macro. Um, at elapsed, I think it's at elapsed. I don't know why it's not tab completing. That's probably a bad sign. Okay, so at elapsed, it, it will return to you the um, elapsed time, like the time it took for that to run. At time, will print out, will give you, will, so, Either way it runs the function. At time will both print out will both print out like how long it took and also um, return the value. So you can see that this part is gray, that's what it printed out. This part is bright white, so that's what it returned. This is a nice thing about nice thing about macros. You can stick them like in the middle of an expression and it'll still work. So if I have um, thirty-two times two plus uh, at time two plus three. And so we get this time for something inside there and also the final result. You can also use um, another frequently used macro is at show. This is really useful for debugging. It's like a step up from print line debugging because you can stick it anywhere in the expression. And not only will it tell you the results of the expression, it will show you, a, it will print out a representation of the expression that you're showing. So in this case, it does plus of two and three, the result is five. And this, uh, this, this is very, really useful for debugging. The only problem you can run into with it is sometimes macros and line numbers don't line up very well. So like if you get an error later, it can like mess up the line numbers in your file a little bit. Like that's the only thing I run into with it that makes it slightly problem, slightly a problem. But it's much more, much easier than print lines because you just you know, stick, stick at show at, about, at the front of the line and it will pr print out but a lot of useful data. Um, so I showed you how to use some macros. You call them with the at sign at the beginning um, and that's just, you know, let you know that like, there's something special going on. This is not just a function. It can mess, it can, it, so the, what a macro does is it takes an unevaluated, it takes arguments that are unevaluated expressions, one or more of them, and then it returns one unevaluated expression that will get stuck in in place of the macro call. Um, so there's two, like this gives you a couple pieces of power. It means you don't have to evaluate your arguments. So you can take like some expression and then mess it with it before it gets evaluated. It also means that you're sticking code from the macro right back into local context. So you can touch local variables. It's as if they wrote the code returned from the macro by hand right where they made the macro call. So that you can use this as shorthand for like whatever you wanna do. Um, in one case, so for example, we can write a benchmarking macro. And so when you benchmark thing, so I'm gonna show you how to write a macro and then we're gonna write this example one. So when you're writing a macro, you use the macro keyword, you give it a name, and then you take one or more arguments. Um, and so 
Now I have E, E is an expression. If I do, let's see, so I can quote, so I, I wanna make a quote block. I'll, show, I'll go back and explain expressions more in a minute. I just wanna give you the, the, like how you, the actual syntax for a macro. So I can type any code I want in here. And then I can run E and then, and in order to put E in here, so by default, if I write E there, it's going to be a piece of code. So it'll like, try to evaluate E in the co calling context. So this isn't going to work. I'll show you how to work, make it work in a minute. But so then end my quote block and my function. So if I do at foo, that's gonna call my macro. And if I give it println, let's see, bar. So now, hello and world are there, but bar isn't. So I have so e is defined to be a constant, which is why it didn't yell at me for the variable name. Uh, let me find one I haven't defined. Okay. Why isn't that working? Oh, right, thank you. I'm glad you guys are paying attention. Okay, so, why isn't this working? So obviously it didn't evaluate our expression since we didn't print anything out. And if I change this to be dollar sign F, that should change the B. So now it calls, so if you use dollar sign, it's just like interpolating into a string. Only this time you're interpolating into a function. Um, and there is a function for seeing the result of a macro expansion. Um, let me see if I can remember the name of it. Um, that's probably not what I want. Yeah, okay. Um, there is a way to find it. Uh, I'm not going to look it up right now, but I'm sure it's documented in the manual, uh, probably in the sections about, so section about macros. In any case, so, so we have foo, um, and with that, it will interpolate the thing in. So this is, this is important because this is how you get hygienic macros. So hygienic macros, like the hi macro hygiene is about differentiating between the macro context and the calling context. So you, in this case, we want it, we're going to interpolate in this variable f, which is from the macro context. So we have to do something special to pull things in from the macro context, because by default, we want to use things that are in the local, the calling context. Um, this is because, like, if your macro is defined in some in your special module where you have like some hidden stuff that people outside your module can't get at, then you want to be able to like keep that stuff hidden. You don't want to accidentally take these values from the macros context and stick them into the to the calling context where they might not be the values you want anymore. Usually, you want to be using values that are in the local context. Um, and so that's how you write a macro. Um, so a little bit about expressions and for when you want to do something a little bit more complicated than just, you know, stick the expression in some place. Um, so if I say that E equals two plus two, I'm overwriting the value, the value for E, which is the constant in main. Um, I'm okay with that. I wasn't planning on using it right now. So, okay, so now I have, so E is an ex expert. So if I take the names of E, it has these fields. Um, so E.head is going to be a call, the symbol call, because that we're doing a function call. Um, E.args is going to be, going to be, for a very basic expression like this, it's just going to be the function, the symbol, which is the function name. So all these, these names preceded by colons are symbols, which are distinct from strings. Um, and then you have, and variable names are all symbols too. 
and then you have the arguments. So this is, you know, this is an any array, which means we can put anything in it, which is how we both stick both symbols and integers into the same array. And then we have e that type. So the type field is usually any. When you're taking, if you have an expression that rep represents a method of a named argument, then you'll be able, then in there you'll find a type field that is set, because, and that is the return value of the function, as determined by type inference. Um, let's see. So now that we have this, oh, I can show you the, an example of a more complicated uh, one. So code typed is these are all four of these functions are like for introspection in Julia, and so you can pass it, pass into them. Um, so they'll take a function or a data type, um, anything that's sort of callable, and so I can pass in like plus, and then I would pass in the, the types I'm going to call it with. So if I were going to call it with two ints, um, this gives me the typed code for that function. So this is the the um, after type inference and optimizations have run on it, this is the like final version of that code. And so if I take, so let's see, so code typed sub one, uh, Julia indexes its arrays by one. So if E equals this, um, I should have the same names of E. E dot type is still any, but if I take E dot args, and I take, so, so now that we have a function, our args got more complicated. They have two um, any arrays that are talking about the variables used and how they're used. And then the third one is the actual body of the function. And it also has an args. Um, but more importantly, it has a type. And this time, the type is actually set. So this is how you can take, so for any generic function, if you do this to it, if you do code typed, and you take the first argument of that. The code types will give you multiple matches um, in some cases, depending on how you call it. So, although the code type usually doesn't. So if you take the first argument of that, you take args of that, the third argument in that, and then that type, it's it, like the body of the function is what will have the return type on it. And so you can look at any, any, any function in Julia and you can find out what the type inference says about its return type. Um, all right, so we're not going to. This I was just showing you a little bit about like the structure of Exper. Occasionally, this is like useful if you're going to dig into some expression they've given you in order to pull something in particular out. We aren't going to need it today. The important part is just the basic um, macro syntax, and so I'm going to explain what you're going to try to write as your macro. Um, so when you're benchmarking things, usually, so you, if you have something you want to benchmark, such as like the sleep function. We would like that to be accurate, right? So, um, so sleep takes a float and will sleep for at least that long. So if I wanted to benchmark sleep, I could do sleep of 0 0.1 for x equals, say, 1 to 10. And so this is going to take a second to run. But so and it's returning all of these values that are what that are like just what sleep returns, which is nothing. Nothing is like null in some languages, only like there's actual like a value there. It's of type not capital N nothing. If you want to compare something to compare it to, so like we have a type nothing and a value of it lowercase nothing. So you can use the lowercase nothing, like you can return nothing, you can check if something is equal to nothing. So you can like work with this, this value and it's not, it's, just what, if you call something else with it, it's not going to give you like an error per se. It's just going to say, well, there's no method that you takes a nothing. Um, okay, so here we can use the, since we don't care about the return type and we want to programmatically use the number, we can use add elapsed and get all of the, those. And then usually you take the median of those because that way you don't have to worry about running it once first and it sort of gets rid of any like randomness in your computer that makes different runs take different amounts. And so that's you know right around 0 0.1. So what I want you to write is a macro that will do this, but you don't, I don't have to type sleep 0 0.1 there. I can just do at bench and put whatever expression instead of sleep 0 0.1 that I want to put in there. And then I'll show you a slightly more advanced version that will also take the, the number of times you want to run it. 
So I'll give you a minute to write the macro, which should be pretty basic, but it means that you'll type in the macro, all of the macro syntax and make sure you remember it. <laughs> 